Hello, and welcome to Legal Cut Pro, the Canadian Entertainment Law Podcast. My name is Michelle Molyneux. And I'm Greg Pang. Today's podcast is the third episode of our music licensing series. And before we get into it, I'm going to read our disclaimer. This podcast is for entertainment and information purposes only. We are not providing you with legal advice and nothing we say on this podcast, including the interview, should be construed as legal advice. If you require legal advice or legal counsel, please consult the services of a lawyer. This podcast is brought to you by Ampia and its professional development team. Special thank you to Jane Toogood, our audio editor. She makes us sound lovely. And you can find Jane on Instagram at JJ underscore two. That's a double O. Good. Excellent. Thank you, Michelle. So for this episode, like you mentioned, is the third in our music licensing series and is an interview with Elizabeth Klink, a very experienced and well-regarded researcher and clearances expert. Yeah, should we jump in? Yes, we should. So everyone, hope you enjoy. All right, uh, today we are here with Elizabeth Klink. And Elizabeth, uh, you're joining us from where? I'm joining you from Collingwood, Ontario. Excellent. And we have Michelle Molyneux on the line as well from? Vancouver, BC. Perfect. And I am here in Edmonton, Alberta. So welcome, Elizabeth, to our podcast, Legal Cut Pro. Uh, Michelle, would you like to just give uh, Elizabeth an introduction with a bit of her bio? Yeah, definitely. Elizabeth Klink has been the owner of eClink Research for 39 years and has worked as producer, researcher, and clearance specialist on hundreds of award-winning Canadian, American, European, and British documentary films that have garnered Emmy, Gemini, Peabody, Grierson, and Academy Awards. Elizabeth's specialties include copyright clearances, visual research, musical clearance, and workshop leader. Nominated for an Emmy in the craft of research and three times for best visual researcher at the Folk Awards in the UK, Elizabeth has won the 2017, 2015, and 2014 and 2013 Canadian Screen Award, the 2015, oh no, I don't know how to pronounce this word. <laughs> Jumeau. Jumeau Award. Thank yeah. you, Elizabeth. And the 2010 Gemini for Best Visual Research. She has won the Yorkton Golden Sheaf Award and was honored with the Focal International Lifetime Achievement Award in 2008. Elizabeth was honored with the Canadian Academy of Canadian Cinema and Television's Board of Directors Tribute Award in 2019 for her body of archive producing work and her volunteerism both in Canada and abroad. Wow. <laughs> That's incredible, Elizabeth. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, we're very honored to have you on our podcast uh, for this interview. And as uh, Michelle mentioned, uh, you mentioned some of your specialties and expertise, but please tell us in your own words what uh, yourself and your company, eClink Research, uh, how you help uh, film and television producers. Eclink Research is a company of one, me, myself, and I, and I um, help film and television producers by uh, researching and obtaining the necessary material they may need for their documentary film or their feature film, or even a webisode or a VR project, if they're looking for archival material, photos, footage, and also music clearances. So those are the areas of expertise that I bring to a project. Just about anything that producer does not film themselves but needs to find or needs to have cleared, um, that's my job. Excellent. Thank you. Elizabeth, what is the best part of your work? I always like to say the best part of what I do is the, is the initial research or the hunting and gathering and finding the material. That's the most exciting. It's probably because I always wanted to be a private investigator or a detective. It, it's finding and, and really over uh, uncovering material that may have not been seen before or may have been overlooked or is languishing in a dusty archive or in a private collection. And so that's my favorite part is finding the material but there's also great there's great challenges and also great rewards in the negotiating and making sure all of the material is properly cleared and and available to be used without any legal issues or any compromise copyright compromises and so that part is very rewarding as well so i i would say they're both equally uh interesting but perhaps the research is the most exciting part of my job hmm. excellent excellent and 
with your expertise, you also have a uh, you hold these uh, whole number of workshops all over the world. I attended yours in Edmonton. What was about a month ago, I believe, and it was yes. a it was an excellent workshop. Thank you very much. Uh, I learned a lot. It was from everything, from all the resources and your experience that you brought to the workshop. It was a great experience. So thank you very much for coming for that. My pleasure. It was <laughs> great. I hadn't been in Edmonton for a while. I had given one about 15 years previously. And so it was wonderful to see some old friends and producers that I've worked with, um, but also to meet so many new people like yourself. So that was, it was very rewarding. And People in the prairies in, in Alberta are always so welcoming. So it was it was a great night. The things that I, the workshops that I I have been doing for the, about the last I'd say it's almost 15 years. I are generally speaking on archive research, but I always include some musical clearance issues as well. And I also include editorial research, which I did for many many years, finding people and finding characters. Uh, experts, those kinds of things, as well as some of the other things you need to do before you shoot a frame, which is location releases and and those venue releases and things like that. So it's a, it's an all around, all encompassing, pretty um, complete. Anything that you don't own and you want to use, um, I can help you with that in my workshops. And there's always great follow up afterwards. I offer a free consult, and then there's a lot of good e handouts that um, that you can refer to. Because sometimes people take workshops and they're not actually working on something that's music or archive heavy, but maybe in two or three years they will be. So. I offer a lot of them in Europe uh, and um, at different film festivals and markets, but I also try to do quite a few at the university and college level because it's not something that's generally covered in a lot of the of the curricula for um, film and television and journalism students, but it's something that they bump up against quite quickly when they start working professionally. So I figure the sooner we can start educating people about the needs and the requirements for the need for good copyright clearance, the better. Excellent. And what's a, one of your favorite places to hold one of these workshops or favorite settings? Well, I just came back from one in Belfast, which was very interesting. I've ne- I had never been to Ireland, and there was, uh, you know, lots to uh, lots to discuss because of what they're going through presently in terms of, of Brexit and what that means uh, for Ireland and Northern Ireland. So that was it was a very interesting mix of people from both countries. So that was interesting. So, uh, but I've also done quite a few in in places like Barcelona, Spain, and in Thessaloniki, Greece, and Malmo. Sweden. So it's been fun because um, there's often different types of films that are being made in different or- locations. And then, of course, I've always enjoyed, I worked for the first five or six years of Imaginative in Toronto, uh, which was a festival for Indigenous films from around the world. So that was very interesting in terms of getting up to speed on things like traditional knowledge and, and the ramifications that has from an illegal point of view. So there's always something new to learn, as well as imparting knowledge I'm always learning as well and I get to meet a lot of filmmakers um, who are at different points on their journey as a filmmaker and I find that very interesting as well isn't that the best though when you're imparting knowledge at the same time you're learning as well so exactly it's the best yes (laughs) what's uh you you mentioned music clearances and we just recorded a couple episodes in our mini series for our podcast on music licensing Mm. In one of the, uh, when the workshop I attended, your workshop that I attended, you provided a whole like list of sources and, and information on music licensing. Would you be able to share with us uh, some of your, your greatest challenges in sourcing and licensing music for the projects that you work on? Yes, well, music licensing has its own particular issues that have to be addressed and they I always say you either have a lot of money or a lot of time when you're working on things that have a lot of music licenses to be obtained and cleared and if you don't have a lot of money then you need a lot of time and I think that's one of the biggest challenges is that often there's one or two people who are looking after all of the requests for say the Canadian film television advertising and a feature world and so that one person is getting a lot of requests every day and so I would say your greatest challenge is is just 
getting in line and, and trying to get a, a fairly reasonable answer, but then also being in a position to be able to negotiate because often you're dealing with things like most favored nations, which means you're all trying to be paid, uh, all of the licenses in your production will be paid the same amount and so that requires a little extra time to set that up there is often um you know back and forth about you know the use and the term the territory the media all of those considerations that need to be addressed probably the biggest challenge i have is i often am hired and i'll be told well there's three songs that we need to have cleared and that's quite early in the production but then through the course of filming and and bringing in archival material it may become obvious that there's instead of three films or, may, or three songs to be cleared, there may be eight or ten. And so often the budget doesn't grow, but the list does. So that's probably my biggest challenge is trying to figure out how I can stretch the budget and, you know, looking at the rights that we need. And is there a way that we can negotiate so that everyone feels like they've been treated fairly and the price is, is reasonable and it's not, and it's within your budget range as well. Those are all the biggest challenges you face. Oh, super interesting. So Elizabeth, what would be the advantage of hiring someone like yourself as a music supervisor rather than having a producer trying to find and obtain the licenses themselves? I would say the greatest advantage of hiring someone like myself or or many of the other wonderful music supervisors and music clearance people that we have here in Canada is that that person has a relationship with the gatekeepers. That person has a uh, an in or knows personally the people that you're applying to for the requests. And so rather than an unknown or perhaps someone who only does it once or twice a year, um, you're hiring someone who's in touch with them and almost on a daily basis. And so it means you do get the process sped up. And often if you're in a real crunch, they will give you great turnaround time and give you not preferential treatment, but because you have a relationship that may be based on 10 or 15 or 40 years, then there's a, there's a relationship there and that actually makes it much easier. I also think that one of the advantages would be you talked about how you have to sometimes stretch the producer's budget and that takes experience. Right. It does. It does. And and also when you're dealing with things like most favored nations, there's lots mm -hmm. of negotiating um, tips that you need to know. I mean, um, generally speaking, I always try to find what I would per perceive to be perhaps the most expensive song or the most in demand or uh, from personal knowledge, I know that the publisher is going to probably come in at the highest. So I always try to work with them first to get the price down because it because it is most favored nations, which means everyone is paid the same amount. You want to make sure that you don't have any surprises at the 11th hour and you want to sort of be very strategic, almost like a chess game and figure out who would who do you ask first and then have everyone else come in under those circumstances and those criteria. And with respect to most favored nations, uh, this is something, the term that some of our listeners uh, might not be completely familiar with. You mentioned that everyone has to be paid the same amount. So with respect to music licensing, that means that if you license, say in your example, the most expensive song first, and if you license that at the most expensive rate, that most expensive song first, then, and if there are most favored nation clauses in another song, then they must be paid the same rate as that most expensive one that you already licensed. I, I know I completely jumbled that up, but maybe there's a better way you can explain it. You no, know, I think you, you did explain it. It basically, it means that it, it, most and favored means that whatever anyone has been paid the most amount of money, then everyone else is favored by being paid the same amount. So the, the real um, strategy is to try to find out what is the most expensive song and get that at a reasonable rate and, and possibly the most, popular or the most well-known or the one with the longest track record or whatever, or if it is a marquee song. And then you're able to go to perhaps uh, a lesser known or a, a cheaper song and say, well, we've been able to negotiate this song by this artist and represented by this publisher uh, for so much. And your song and is of comparable length and being used in the same way. That's also very important. The use and the, and the length has to be this more or less the same. Um, would you be agreeable to be being paid the same amount? And it's it's a way of, of making sure that if you don't have a huge budget and you're only able to pay everyone a small amount of money, that no one is going to get paid more. And that's the fairness factor, I call it. So most of the times when people are working 
um, are allowing a song to be used in a documentary, they know they're not going to be going to get rich from it. It's not like an advertising license. It's not like a feature film license. It's not like a drama on television. It's usually a smaller budget. So the way to make everyone agreeable is to pay everyone the same. And so whether that's Leonard Cohen or Neil Young or Joni Mitchell um, or a small garage band, then everyone is paid the same and everyone walks away feeling like they've made a contribution to the film and they have contributed their their work, but everyone is being paid the same. And now if you change the use and one of one person's song is in the opening titles, opening credits or the closing titles, or it's being used to promote or, or whatever, then that has to be compensated fairly as well. Um, but it does, it does, it is an important way to negotiate to make sure that you can keep the budget reasonable for a documentary film. I'm not talking about taking advantage of anyone or ripping anyone off, but it is a very important distinction between a documentary film budget and a fiction film or feature film or cinema film budget. Um, One thing I just wanted to follow up with uh, regarding music licensing is I think in your workshop, you had mentioned some publishers, they, and I'm wondering if they still do this, is that requests are to be sent uh, by fax. Now, is that something that's still fairly common for uh, publishers? And I know I asked because the lawyer world, we're one of the last professions probably to use fax, you know, because we have to deal with mm. courthouses and courthouses uh, and even, you know, government offices. They, a lot of times they insist on correspondence by fax or, you know, by drop of the writing or by letter or whatever. Right. So uh, I know it's a, it's a small detail, but I was wondering, is, is that something that is usual? It was the case. It was, it was one of the last, um, one of the last industries that I was sending and receiving faxes. That's changed though. I would say um, I, I haven't used a fax for a music license in quite a long time. Um, now, you you know, scan and, and sign. Generally speaking, though, all of the long-form license agreements have to be submitted in hard copy. Um, you can, of course, scan and send something ahead to expedite if you have a broadcast or a film festival that you have to get your film into and you need it for theirs and emissions insurance policy, then you can speed it up. But generally speaking, most of the time, a hard copy is needed to be sent um, either by courier or by registered mail at the end. But for the back and forth in terms of the negotiating and the deal memos and the credits and and all of that, that can be done digitally by email at this point. Perfect. That's progress. (laughs) It is. It is. Some people don't have fax machines anymore. That's a problem. <laughs> well, and that, that is a big problem. Sometimes I, there are some correspondences that we have to deal with fax. And there, there are some documents that you just might not want to send digitally because there's some sensitivity to them. Of course, of course. Uh, even, yeah. you know, uh, and some are, you know, like, in spite of encrypted, you can have encrypted emails and stuff like that. But hardline faxes are... I suppose more secure uh, than than digital faxes, but anyway, I have to keep a fax uh, line myself. Uh, do you still uh, have a fax machine or or have a digital? I fax do. Machine? I yeah. have I have a designated fax line, and um, I get a lot of requests for duct cleaning, and uh, <laughs> you know, have you got junk? You know, but I I have to say I haven't received an actual fax for my work for a long time. <laughs> Actually, you know, that's interesting uh, what you mentioned, because I used to get spam facts quite a bit as well. And yeah. it seems to have kind of died off. <laughs> yeah. last, last I hope so. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think it's probably don't, you probably don't get a whole lot of good ROI from doing spam faxing, right? Exactly. <laughs> uh, Elizabeth, are there any horror stories that you can share with us or maybe some great stories to share with us? Well, um, I have have been able to keep the horror stories to a minimum, I have to say. Uh, I have had some great stories. There have been wonderful examples over the years of um, people finding finding material um, that they didn't know existed. There were uh, there was a pair of identical twins um, that were in a concentration camp in the Second World War, and um, we found some footage of them as very young women, young girls, and um, so that was very exciting the first time they saw that material. Oftentimes, the footage will take you to very interesting people, and that's always exciting. Oftentimes, we think of finding the footage after we found the 
subjects for a film or the characters for a film, but oftentimes the material, the archival material can sometimes take you to some great stories. So those are, those are wonderful moments of, of, uh, of, of finding great un, before seen material. And so I've had lots of those types of, of high spots in my life. And I guess some of the times it's just uncovering a great cache of material. Uh, while I was working on a film about the early days of Greenpeace, there was some marvelous material that was still in 16 millimeter footage format in the local CBC Vancouver offices. And so that was very exciting because it had not been seen and a lot of it hadn't been shown before. So when you find things not only internationally but here at home that that are rare and wonderful, that's that's a real high point. And also um, it's a way of preserving them. I think that's the greatest thing that I could say about the job I do is every time a film is made in preparation for making it into a film, you take it from a format that may be analog or a photograph that's in a photo album or a piece of film negative and you you ensure that it's digitized and is able to be preserved and you're kind of creating you're preserving it and that to me is the most exciting thing about the end of the job the post production part is is knowing that that material will be preserved in a in a modern format that makes it accessible to other people yeah, and that's so important because sometimes these original materials might only exist one copy in that one location, mm-hmm. right? And now it's exactly. being preserved well, and shared and digitized, and that's great. Or what happened, again, with the Greenpeace film where um, some of the material was classified and we weren't able to get it from mm-hmm. the the U.S., but I was able to find a pristine 16-millimeter 16, 16 print of some of the M. Chitka bomb blasts that the Greenpeace people were protesting against in the early days in a a very obscure little library in Alaska and the film had not been played so it was almost brand new and so the material it it became our negative because everything was being blown up to 4k so we wanted the original to be as clean and fabulous as possible and unfortunately sometimes people in the early days of video transferred material from negative to what they thought was going to be this fantastic format and that might have been VHS which is <laughs> yes. very sad because now it just doesn't look very good and so I always laugh and say the the worst sort of years for for archive or you know the seven, six, 70s and 80s because a lot of the master format was so poor and I look at you know photographs from the Civil War in the United States from you know, the middle 1800s and they're gorgeous, you know, glass plate, glass negatives and, and gorgeous images. And then I think, how could we have gone so wrong not so yes. long ago? <laughs> but we do. We did. So there we go. So I, whenever I, I, I find original material that I know is going to be better, of course, that's what we want to use just because so many of the films now are in HD and, you know, 2K, 4K, 8K, 16K. So it, it shows up every little imperfection. Exactly. And what is the equivalent of like VHS footage, like 120p or something like that? It's a yeah. very low it's, resolution. It's very low. I, the other the low point in photography was the Instamatic camera from the 1960s and 70s. And everything's so pixelated and, and uh, horrible. Yeah. So there, as I say, it's not the, it w- wasn't our shining hour. <laughs> no, I, I don't doubt it. <laughs> Elizabeth, thank you for this interview again. And can you tell people where uh, they can find you? Yes, certainly. I have a website. It's Elizabeth with a Z or Z at Elizabeth Klink, and that's spelled K L I N C K dot com. And uh, my all my contact information is there. So my phone and email. I'm on Twitter, and um, so I also have a, a business Facebook page. So all of that information can be found there. And uh, love to hear from anyone who's interested in working on a project together. Excellent. And I see that you have an upcoming work shop in Toronto on September 18th called Navigate the World of Archives. So I'd like to just right. push that out there to promote that a bit. And you can buy tickets for that at elizabethclink.com slash workshops. And we'll put these, uh, this in the show notes, your website in the show notes and your uh, social media, um, your, your Twitter account as well, so that people can uh, have quick access to it there. 
Excellent. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure speaking with both of you. Thank, thank, you. thank you for your interest. Your <laughs> okay. pleasure's all ours. Yeah, thank you. It's for been much. wonderful. Thank you. 